Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Jack D'Angelo. I want to thank you all for joining us this morning. This is a very exciting time for everyone in New York State. And, and we're here thanks to the works of families and patients that have moved this question forward on a political level. So I thank you for that. Today, I hope we move that educational process forward even more. One of the take home messages from the day is that you've got to go home and educate your docs. Your doctors need to learn. Getting everyone to believe the message that we're telling them that this is a medicine and needs to be treated with the respect of a medicine is still continues. So today you're gonna meet our team at Sativa and we're gonna start the day off. I'm gonna introduce, although I know he doesn't need any words, um, um, my friend and your friend, Josh Stanley. Thanks, Jack. Thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you so much for, for coming out today. We're dealing right now with a human rights issue that is so important, and I, I don't have to tell you that. Anna, Olivia, I have to think that while they may no longer be here with us right now, the opportunity that they have in spirit is going to help save thousands of lives. And that's not just here in the state of New York. That's worldwide. So we have a job to do right now. And that job is to bring relief through this form of natural treatment to the children here in the state of New York. I know that it doesn't seem like it's moved very fast. And certainly it hasn't because we're talking about a very natural, a very organic, a very benign plant in various forms that's proven to be very, very beneficial for neurological disorders, particularly pediatric epilepsy. And it seems like a no-brainer and a human rights issue that anybody should be able to get their hands on this right now. And no parent should have to sit and watch a television show and watch another child get better when they live across an invisible border or a boundary we call a state or a country we, we can do better than this as humans we can do better than this as politicians I, I don't know any of you to, that uh, your children care whether they you ride an elephant or a donkey what political party you're with doesn't care what religion you are this has crossed every issue and moved right into the issue of human rights so thank you all for all the perseverance that, that you've shown, the resilience that you've shown. You're the reason that we're here today. You're the reason that Sativa Medical is here to work, that Strains of Hope, the nonprofit arm, is here to work for you. Now, um, a big reason that we're here today is to explain some of the difference between who we are, Sativa Medical, um, what we do. We've seen children respond incredibly well to cannabidiol treatment or CBD treatment. And then it, uh, there's other children who have not perhaps responded as well to a cannabidiol treatment, but they need another different type of compound that's found in the plant, whether that's a, a, a CBN, a CBG, a THCA, CBDA, a combination thereof, a THC. And we have a long way to go when it comes to deciding and understanding the efficacy of this plant. And so Sativa Medical is here to help provide standardization, one of the most important parts of this. We're not just talking about cutting a plant down, growing a plant, harvesting it, and then extracting it and giving it out blind. What we're talking about here is, is, is science and finding what ratio it is that's going to fit and correspond for a particular illness or a particular disease state. In this situation, neurological dysfunction, certainly pediatric intractable epilepsy. Uh, we found that d different physiologies respond to different things, but it's a very, very, we take this very, very seriously. We can't come in and give your child one particular treatment that works and works incredibly well and then be able to come back and give a different ratio or a different treatment down the road. So Sativa Medical is working to provide accurate dosing and standardization measures in that regard. When we talk about 
multi-compound medicines. Uh, what we are really talking about is a new functionality in uh, science. Some call it actual uh, functional medicine, which is becoming more and more prevalent on the horizon as, as we begin to understand more how our physiological systems work. Therefore, our treatments, our modalities of treatment has to change. And one of the most exciting things I think that we've seen in the realm of treatment with, uh, with pediatric epilepsy is the fact that we're not seeing a child develop immunities or antibodies to this, but rather what we're seeing is uh, a standard dosage per uh, milligrams per kilo of body weight. And of course, the children that respond to this and continually get better only up their dose as they continue to gain weight as opposed to a traditional pharmacology where you take more and more and more of a particular uh, substance until your body hits that medical plateau and then you start again with something molecularly similar to trick the body. So it, 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 we're very excited about this new applied science, but we have to take this from a very narrow and pragma pragmatic approach, which brings me back to the fact that I know the state of New York doesn't seem like it's moving fast, but out of the seven or eight states that I've worked in so far, from a legislative standpoint, they really are moving fast. Um, they're, they're moving faster, I should say, than any other state that I've seen so far. So one of the, one of the things that, that, that really um, uh, upsets me is the fact that we hear a lot out there when we get the rules and regulations from the state of New York about, um, well, there's not going to be access to this. There's not. You're going to have parents will have to drive and go, you know, uh, a long way away. Um, the, that uh, by January we're not going to be able to to have medicine. Um, all of these different types of things that I hear on a day-to-day -day basis really drive the message away in regards to the uh, message that I think we should all be talking about, which is the positive nature of the bill and what it is that you have here. Because hope is on the way. Help is on the way. And if we can stay positive, I mean, a lot of people look at me and they say, Josh, how can you be so positive all the time about all of this? You know, what about this? What about that? Well, what about this? What about that? If we don't come together as a, as a group, as a unit, and start working together from a positive perspective and changing some of the negative aspects of these laws, which there's always going to be those, then we can't progress and we can't move forward. So today, I want to be able to have an open conversation about this. Let's lay the concerns out on the table. Let's, let's lay the fears out on the table. I know there's concerns over, are we going to have different types of medicine? So, I, you know, you talk about being able to help personalize medicine for my child. How is that possible under this law? Let's bring that up and talk about that today. You talk about ease of access to this. If I live in the southern tier and there's not uh, a dispensary or a clinic for a couple hundred miles, how are we going to get access to this? Let's talk about that today. These are things that we're working on together and working on with you. You're not alone. Okay? You have questions, you reach out. We'll help answer them. We are here for you. And you're here for us. We, we, we hope to, to make this a, a very special reciprocal relationship as we move forward. We truly love you all very, very much and, and are here to serve you. So thank you very much, guys. And I, I, I want to I keep this open for questions, so I don't really want to get into two uh, specific topics right now. What I'd like to do is introduce Kim Volman, the chief of our pharmacology department, to say a few words. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Kim Volman. Um, from New York. I've been a pharmacist for 14 years and I had uh, the honor of meeting Josh and Sativa Medical and this, the whole crew about six months ago. Um, what, what Sativa Medical is doing, it's changing people's lives. It's bringing hope, it's bringing medication, and it's breaking down the walls that has been set in front of us by the government and by different organizations that prevented people like Sativa Medical from creating medications that actually helped people's lives and save their families. So it's a, it's a great honor to be here. Um, we're working on different things of helping people's lives by providing transportations, transportation systems to those who cannot uh, get to us and doing various, various things from multi-compounding, which will open up different medicinal venues to helping people's lives. We're doing everything we can. No other medical organization 
is like Sativa Medical. And that's why it's my honor and my pleasure to be part of this group. Thank you guys for everything. And we, we thank you for coming out here and supporting us because we're here to serve you. We're here to help you all your lives get better, not from a patient's point of view, but also from a family point of view. So thank you once again for coming down here and being a part of our group. Thank you so much for your support. Well, let me introduce my other colleague, Dr. Jack D'Angelo. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a pediatrician first by trade, and then I became a pediatric rehab physician, and then ended up in uh, basically general physiatry, which is physical medicine and rehab. And during the course of my career, one of my greatest frustrations has always been that we sometimes treat every single patient as if they are the same, right? Our medications are always made kind of to apply to everyone. And, and unfortunately, that has been the approach that we've had in medicine for the last 30 years that I've been in practice, that every patient is the same. Well, you know, the dirty little secret is every patient isn't the same. And that's what we're kind of stepping onto when we talk about can cannabinoid medicine. Because we're really recognizing that perhaps medicines need to be tailored a little bit for every single patient that receives them. And that's kind of exciting. And for a doc, that's kind of rejuvenating because so much of what we do in medicine is kind of handed up to us today. And this is kind of a grassroots operation of taking medicine back from big pharma and the people who have controlled it for so long. So this is from you, right? When we talk and we're treating our patients, probably the most frustrating thing I hear from a patient when I'm treating them is, Doc, it's a little better. Because I'm thinking, really, what's a little better? Are you just saying that to make me happy? Or is that real? And so, you know, we want to make big differences. We want to see lives get better. And when we treat patients, we are treating their families. That's also the art of medicine that has been lost over time. But that's really what happens, right? Having a sick family member affects the whole family. It changes the dynamics for everyone in that family. And we've got to start empowering ourselves to take it back. And that's what you're doing here today. And I thank you for that. All right. Uh, the first question is, and it's really open to everyone on the team here. Um, what about adult epilepsy? And how will it help MS in adults and in children? G great question, whoever asked that. Um, start with adult epilepsy. Um, it, what, what we've seen, one of, one of the most uh, astounding things that we've seen is we began to step out of the just the realm of, of cannabidiol or pure CBD treatment. And we start to experiment with a lot of the other parts of the plant, the other cannabinoid compounds. What science looks for first is they look for what we call responders, okay? What we see in cannabinoid treatment when we get out of this single compound ideology of CBD type only is we have a hard time finding anyone who doesn't respond, okay? That's, that's really an anomaly for us in medical science, especially when you're targeting a specific illness. So uh, the answer in short is from pediatric epilepsy to adult epilepsy, we see uh, dramatic results across the board. The issue though, and the reason that we haven't been able to see responders in, in adult epilepsy as much is quite simple. Because of Olivia, because of Anna, because these kids don't have time. And I, I know we put a lot of emphasis on the kids because that's where our heart lies, that's where on the, in the race against time, and that's what we're here committed to first and foremost, beyond any illness or disease state that are, that's approved right now in New York. But it shouldn't dishearten the adults who are dealing with intractable and, and regular uh, um, adult uh, level epilepsy. We, we have our, our sites targeted on that, but unfortunately it is children first. Um, the next part of that question is MS, I believe. 
Okay, multiple sclerosis. So you know what this this I think uh, let, let me give you a bit of a brief understanding, a forty thousand foot view, if you will, of why uh, we we jump from epilepsy to multiple sclerosis to different types of autoimmune dysfunctions to cancers and diabetes and neurological dysfunctions, and 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 the mystery beyond this because it starts to sound a little bit like snake oil, right? Like oh yeah, cannabis is going to work for all of that, right? Well, it does, and the reason that it does is uh, is newfound science. I say newfound. This is found in 1992. So relatively new. Uh, in 1992, a man named Lumir Hanoush from the Czech Republic discovered what we call anandamide. Okay. Um, in 1995, we discover what we call AG2. Now, you don't have to worry about remembering that. These are the two endocannabinoids that the human body, actually every mammal in the earth, produces. Just about seven years ago, science discovers that these two endocannabinoids that our bodies produce happen to be the most prevalent cell receptor system in every mammal on the earth. Now, this is another profound discovery because those two endocannabinoids that every one of our bodies create, every person in here, they serve two primary functions, neurological function and immune function. Okay, those parents out there, I think I, you know that I would challenge anybody to find many illness or disease states that fall out of those two particular categories. So, how does that relate to the cannabis plant? Well, in the cannabis plant, we have what do I constantly refer to as cannabinoids, right? The compounds found in the plant. We actually call these phytocannabinoids. It just so happens that these phytocannabinoids are able to serve as what science calls agonists. A better, better term would be um, re reactors or triggers. And so they serve as triggers to go in and elicit response or begin a response in our endocannabinoid system. Immune function and neurological function, okay? So if you picture it, the way that I picture it in the most simple terms for me sometimes is that when a child is deficient in for, uh, some form or fashion, these phytocannabinoids are able to come in and bridge the gap in that regard. This is really new science, and, and we believe, we, we wholeheartedly believe that this simple science, as we t start taking deeper and deeper dives into this, is actually has the ability to change the way that we not just view natural health care, but health care in general. This is astounding, and what I was talking about, when as with the more we understand about the human body, the more our treatment modalities have to change with that type of understanding. So, multiple sclerosis is certainly a, a, a condition that falls within this category, and is why we're seeing dramatic results, albeit from an anecdotal and observational standpoint, we're working to bring that into the clinical realm, but in short, what we have seen through cannabinoid therapy and multiple sclerosis is a, uh, a dramatic um, slowdown in the progression of the disease through different uh, types of ingestion methods. The next question, um, it's why is the government so against this medication if it's helping people? There's plenty of politicians who are definitely intrigued by this. And because when you start to talk about illness, everybody has somebody. Everybody loves somebody. And so it does touch someone's heart. And so people do care. It's just weeding through a system, right? Weeding through a process, and that's why it's happening. Josh, anything you wanna to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I believe that what we're looking at here is the world's first organic, whole plant compound that is surpassing the efficacy of many FDA approved pharmaceuticals, whether they're single compound or multi-compound. So I would challenge you to ask yourself, what is another single, what is another whole plant organic compound out there? I, I use, I, I, I fall back all the time on St. John's wort. That's an organic whole plant compound. Is there any evidence that it cures or helps, alleviates depression? No, there's no clinical evidence as such, so it is a placebo, but if it did what this plant we're talking about today did, then it would probably have been illegal for the last 85 years as well. Um, efficacy drives action, and then what, what that drives is, is patentability, okay? Pharmaceutical companies will take a botanical and something right out of nature, and what they're going to typically do with that is, first, th first things first, they isolate it, okay? And they're not using what we call the entourage effect, or what I believe nature intended. So when you see the, the whole plant extracts that our company are able to put together and standardize, you see a dramatic 
increase in the reduction of seizures than you do with, with a single compound isolate. Now, most companies are going to take a step further and take that isolated compound, and they're going to synthesize it. Okay, that's all Marinol is, which is a synthetic form of tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC. Um, you know, then, then you're, you're moving into a, a whole different category because why do they synthesize? Well, why do they isolate? Because they can patent it, because they can own it. And that's what we've seen over the last 85 uh, years and 90 years in pharmacology, unfortunately, is we have seen this, uh, this uh, uh, health care system turn into more of a profit care system. And uh, it, it's, it's quite unfortunate in that regard. But, uh, but there is a lot of money to be made. And right now, what we're talking about, what Dr. Jack is talking about, is reverting back to what nature has given us. You know, don't, we're not worried about the patents. <laughs> we're not worried about the formulas. We're worried about helping to, uh, to provide a different type of treatment modality. Uh, this question I'm going to direct to you, Kim. Okay, as patients' um, numbers increase, how will you guarantee that the quality of the medicine needed for my child will be available uh, if we buy month, bi-monthly, et cetera? Our, our main focus from Sativa Medical is to ensure that our facility is able to sustain any type of uh, medication requests that we need. So we, have the, we will have the capabilities and the personnel needed to ensure that everybody that needs the medication, it will be readily available for them. And nobody would have to go without medication or shortages at any given point. So as the progression of and a higher influx of patients start coming to uh, the, the dispensaries, we will make sure that our pr production increases and that we will be able to facilitate the medication as quickly as possible to the patient to ensure that nobody goes without a dose. That would be our main objective. I also want to back that up with, you know, what we're dealing with is something we know that once a child or, or an adult is on this medication, we have an enormous responsibility here, okay? They can't go without it. It can't change, just like Kim said, uh, but keep in mind that we, we are dealing with a three-tiered, vertically integrated system. That is very in-depth for one company to take on. Do you think McDonald's slaughters their own cattle? No. Any, any, any company is going to have a viable manufacturing model, a viable wholesale model, a viable retail model. We have to grow this from seed or clone harvest that, extract that, put that into the lab, create a standardized product, and then make sure that your children have this for the rest of their lives, okay? So what does that tell you? We better back up our backups, right? So we better back up our agricultural facilities because, we're, again, we are dealing with agriculture. And, the, the, you know, there are things that happen from crop failures and things like that. So our company takes a very hard look at this and... Uh, the quantity is, uh, uh, question is huge. Um, we can't take on m more people than we know that we're not going to be able to supply this in ad infinitum. Um, this question I'm going to direct to Kathy. Uh, Kathy has been our liaison with the physicians and with the institutions that we work with. Um, are the area physicians indicating that they are open to the uh, medical marijuana discussion? And is it appropriate to ask their advice on dosing at this time? Hi, everybody. I am Kathy Caridi. I'm a family nurse practitioner. I just want to introduce myself so you know that I'm, the, I'm answering the question coming from experience. So I've been a nurse practitioner for 17 years, a nurse for over 35 years. And I just want to start by saying thank you so much for bringing your children and sharing your stories. It's been so powerful for us to be here in front of you, and it really makes everything that we're doing and all the effort that we're putting into this really meaningful. So let me get to the, to the physician question. So I, I looked at this question, and, and I kind of smiled because... I'm going to go to the second part of the question. Is it appropriate to ask their advice at dosing? It's always appropriate to ask the advice of your healthcare provider, whether it's a physician, a physician assistant, or a nurse practitioner. Because we, I found in my practice that sometimes my patients know a little bit more than me. Sometimes my patients know a lot more than me. So it's really important that you share what you know, and you should not be shy about that. All providers have an oath to take care of their patients. So the part of the first question, are the area physicians indicating that, are they, that they are open for discussion 
honestly, if they're not open for a discussion, it's time to change providers. You need... You need to really be sure that you're, he may or she may not be open for discussion right away in the 15 minute slot that you're allotted that person, but you should be sharing the information and letting them know, doc, nurse practitioner, PA, I am gonna come back to you to discuss this. I want you to do your homework. I need you to do your homework. So these questions are crucial. Get it out to your physicians or your healthcare provider, and please do not be shy about asking them questions, whatever you have because they'll do the research for you if you can't do it or you'll bring it to them that's a these are great questions this is re this is how it happens this is where it happens you know you've heard that it takes a spark and you have to get a fire well we need a rager we need a barn burner okay and that's what's coming to the state of New York I know it feels like sometimes that things get so hopeless okay um, and, and and really hope is, is all you have but until a few years ago, I think we could all say that intractable epilepsy didn't really carry a lot of hope. So you've made a lot of ground, you've made a lot of progress, and you've made a lot of progress due to the families here that are in this room. We don't forget what we're here for, but just like Jack said, we are in this together. We are a family. We are gonna do it together. You have hope. Hope and help is on the way. You have a question, you reach out. We're here for you, anytime, any day. We so look forward to getting you guys, to know you guys better, and we're so blessed, and we're so honored to be able to be a part of your lives. We love you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.